Chapter Six of The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood. Chapter Six Caught in a Typhoon those who have never enjoyed the experience of suddenly coming upon a treasure of enormous value a substantial share of which one knows will one day be one's own will naturally suppose that the crew of the yorkshire lass would be one of the happiest and most contented little communities on the face of the earth and assuredly they ought to have been in so far at least as the prospective possession of great wealth can confer happiness for little as any of us knew of the actual value of the treasure we had so easily obtained we knew enough to feel assured that when the time for division should arrive we should each be rich enough to be independent for the rest of our lives of any need to work for a living but on the contrary as a matter of fact the acquisition of the treasure gave rise to a condition of restiveness and discontent that caused me grave uneasiness not that i was greatly surprised from the moment when i first climbed in over the brigantine's rail from the saturn's lifeboat i recognized that the presence of the four dagos in the ship's company was likely to breed discord but it was not until i witnessed the mad covetousness with which they flung themselves upon the chest containing coin and proceeded to help themselves regardless of the rights of us others that i actually began to scent real serious trouble for i then foresaw that having once glimpsed the treasure those men would never more be content until it was actually theirs to squander in the debauchery that they called pleasure the trouble which i anticipated developed within twenty-four hours of our departure from the estuary first taking the form of a demand on the part of the six seamen in the forecastle that the division of the treasure should be effected forthwith and when i pointed out that owing to the impossibility of justly valuing such articles as gold and silver candlesticks salvers bowls cups caskets jewelled crosses articles of jewelry and gems such a division as they desired was out of the question they insisted that the ship should forthwith be taken to the nearest civilized port in order that the treasure might be turned into money and the division effected to this i replied that only in london would it be possible to obtain anything approaching fair value for so enormous a treasure as ours therefore to london i intended to take it whereupon the dagos became so violently insubordinate that forcible measures had to be resorted to and a very pretty fight ensued between them on the one hand and the boatswain carpenter and myself on the other before we succeeded in putting the quartet in irons and dumping them down upon the ballast in the main hold where i informed them they would remain until they should show unmistakable signs of having come to their senses such resolute action coupled with the fact that during their confinement their food consisted solely of coarse ship biscuit and water soon brought the insubordinate ones to their bearings a message of unconditional surrender being brought from them to me within thirty-six hours of their confinement promising good behavior in the future if i would release them and permit them to return to duty naturally i was more than willing to accept the olive branch thus held out for the absence from duty of four able seamen out of our little company left the ship perilously undermanned and would have involved us in serious difficulties might indeed have imperiled the safety of the ship had we fallen in with bad weather fortunately however the weather for the first week after our departure from the estuary proved to be almost too fine for our liking consisting as it did of light baffling contrary airs interspersed with spells of calm thus the temporary confinement below of the four foreigners proved of no disadvantage to us although i was heartily glad to have them back on duty again nevertheless it soon became apparent that their reformation was like beauty only skin deep and that at heart they were as ready as ever to give trouble the exceptionally fine weather 
to which i have just referred continued for nearly a month during which with much pooling and hauling at tacks sheets and braces we contrived to jockey the brigantine fairly into the pacific where i intended to hunt up a cargo of copra sandalwood and shell on the way home but such an extraordinarily long spell of fine weather as we had been experiencing was bound to break sooner or later and the break came during the afternoon of our twenty-seventh day out the barometer which for nearly three weeks had been standing well above thirty inches gave us the first warning of the coming change by an ominously rapid decline of the mercury which was quickly succeeded by a subtle veiling of the sky the clear rich blue of which gradually changed to a uniform tint of dirty white in the midst of which the sun hung a mere shapeless blotch the light breeze that during the earlier part of the day had been fanning us along at a scant three knots died away leaving the surface of the sea oil smooth and colorless while the stagnant air grew so hot that we literally felt the heat of it in our nostrils with every breath we drew the quality of the air seemed to change too rendering it difficult to breathe so that we found ourselves gasping for breath at frequent intervals while perspiration poured from us in streams that we could distinctly feel trickling down our bodies and limbs so enervating were the conditions that none of us cared to make the slightest unnecessary movement yet the steady decline of the mercury was a warning that i dared not ignore accordingly at eight bells in the afternoon watch when enderby took charge of the deck i showed him the barometer expressed the conviction that we were in for a typhoon and instructed him to set all hands to the task of stripping the ship to a close reef topsail reefed fore topmast staysail and closed reefed main trysail when the boatswain went forward and gave the necessary orders the men received them as i had quite expected with black looks muttered curses and inarticulate growls but the sight of chips and me lowering and stowing the big mainsail while they surlily slouched about the deck letting go halyards cluing up and hauling down and perhaps more than all the aspect of the heavens conveying a message that no man could misinterpret caused them somewhat to modify their attitude and by four bells the ship was nearly ready for what might come as we could make her but our preparations were completed not a moment too soon for we were in a latitude where twilight is unknown and with the disappearance of the sun below the horizon there closed down upon us a darkness that might literally be felt for any attempt to move about the decks well as we believed ourselves to be acquainted with them resulted in constant collisions with unexpected obstacles this bewildering state of affairs continued until shortly after five bells in the first watch when we became aware that the atmosphere was being subtly and gradually suffused with ruddy light coming from we knew not where the change was so gradual that it was impossible to say just when it began but within half an hour of our first perception of it the light had grown so strong that not only were we able to move about freely without running foul of things but standing aft by the useless wheel and looking forward every detail of the ship's hull spars sails and rigging stood out clearly and sharply like a silhouette cut out of black paper against a background of shining oil-smooth water and dense masses of twisting and writhing cloud shapes all reflecting the weird mysterious ruddy light it was an awe-inspiring phenomenon strongly suggestive of the supernatural and from the uneasy glances that were directed aft from the forecastle, it was not difficult to surmise that none of the men had ever before beheld anything like it neither had we of the afterguard for that matter and i have no doubt that i should have been very much more seriously alarmed than i was at the spectacle had i not read somewhere the description of a hurricane that had been similarly heralded as it was i was by no means happy at the prospect of what was in store for us asking myself uneasily whether quite all had been done that it was possible to do to prepare the ship for the impending ordeal there was but one thing i could think of and that was to order all the scuttles to be securely closed and this was at once done although it rendered the cabins insupportably hot and close 
of course i should have liked to send down the royal and topgallant yards and to have housed the fore topgallant mast and main topmast and i would have attempted it had we had a decently willing crew but i doubted whether the dagos would have undertaken the job except under compulsion and i was unwilling to engage in a tussle with a crowd of insubordinates with a hurricane threatening to burst upon us at any moment naturally under the circumstances i never dreamed of turning in nor did any of the others for that matter the boatswain and chips keeping me company aft while a glance forward showed that even the foxhole bunch jealous as they were of their rights preferred for once in a way to spend their watch below on deck shortly after midnight the weird ruddy light began to fade indicating that the crisis was approaching i accordingly sent the boy billy below secured the companion doors and closed the slide knowing this to be one of the ship's most vulnerable points in a heavy sea such as one might expect when the gale should burst upon us and thereafter there was nothing more to be done but to abide events it was about half an hour later and the light had almost entirely faded when we got our first distinct warning to stand by it came in the form of a sudden scurry of wind apparently from nowhere in particular that swept whining and moaning over the ship causing the canvas to flap violently and then it was gone this occurred perhaps half a dozen times each gust lasting a few seconds longer and being perceptibly stronger than the one which preceded it smiting the canvas with such violence that i quite expected to see it fly out of the bolt ropes while the brigantine being only in ballast rocked and staggered like a drunken man fortunately there remained just light enough to enable us to trace the direction from which those tornadoes came with their help therefore chips and i who at once sprang to the wheel managed to get the ship's head round before the hurricane itself struck us enderby going forward to stand by on the forecastle it announced its approach by a low weird unearthly moaning that with terrifying rapidity swelled to a deafening compound of the shrieking yell of the swooping wind and the hiss of the tempest-lashed sea as it rushed in the form of a wall of ghastly heaped up phosphorescent foam stretching from horizon to horizon straight down upon the ship the spectacle of that unbridled outburst of elemental fury was awe-inspiring beyond the power of words to describe but it was terrifying too as was evidenced by chip's remark a moment before the gale struck us leaning over toward me as we stood on opposite sides of the wheel he yelled good-bye sir this is the finish the ship ain't built that could weather such an outfly as this and i felt very much inclined to agree with him to me it seemed impossible that any combination of wood and metal the work of men's hands however cunningly fashioned and deftly put together could withstand such a frenzied onslaught as that which was about to burst upon us another instant and we were within the hurricane's clutches with a yell of indescribable fury the blast struck us and as the storm wave boiled in over our taffrail and swept along the deck filling it to the level of the rail and taking with it in its rush forward every movable thing in its way i saw the storm trysail fill with a terrific jerk of the doubled sheets and then go flying away out of the bolt ropes like a sheet of tissue paper whether or not the remainder of our canvas had withstood the strain i could not for the moment determine for i was up to the armpits in the surging water pinned by it and the pressure of the wind so hard up against the wheel that i momentarily expected to feel my breastbone collapse under the pressure luckily the gale came up square astern and hit us end on luckily also we were in ballast and the ship was therefore quite lively nevertheless i felt the hull under my feet tremble perceptibly under the tremendous strain to which it was subjected as the wind and sea smote her and for a few breathless moments i believe she was foundering under us then as she gradually freed herself of the water that flooded her decks she gathered way and went foaming off before the gale like a mad thing the next occurrence of which i was clearly conscious was that chips was again leaning over toward me and shouting my god mr blackburn that was a narrow squeak if ever there was one 
if anybody had told me that the old hooker would have stood it i would have believed them but i think we're all right now so long as we keep her running afore it if only the spars and rigging will stand the strain but what about what's ahead of us sir is there anything that we're likely to run foul of nothing so far as i know answered i the chart shows a clear sea for some hundreds of miles to the eastward and before we have run that distance the gale will have blown itself out but there is enderby trying to claw his way aft i wonder what news he has for us the unnatural ruddy light in the sky had by this time quite died out but it was replaced by a faint ghostly sheen emitted from the foaming surface of the wind-scourged sea and by this feeble radiance it was just possible to discern the burly form of the boatswain laboriously clawing aft along the port bulwarks against the tremendous pressure of the wind presently he reached us and seated himself upon the wheel grating at my feet gasping and panting for breath well enderby i shouted what's the news from the fore end of the ship did the sea that pooped us do any damage not so much as might have been expected returned the boatswain the jolly boat's clean gone the lifeboat's a wreck the tore gallant bulwark both sides is gone forward of the fore rigging the staysail blowed out of the bolt ropes directly the gale struck us and worst of all we've lost three of our little crowd lost i ejaculated what do you mean man just what i says mr blackburn answered the boatswain we've lost three hands van holst mendel and manning the sea that broke aboard us must have took em unawares and swept em over the bows for they was on deck before we was swept and when she cleared herself they was gone jove that's bad news indeed said i we were short-handed enough before but we shall be worse off than ever now and they were all good men too we can ill spare them ay agreed enderby there's others that we could better have spared if some of em had to go but as to them being good men well they was good enough sailor men i won't deny but if we'd lost em any other way than being drowned, if they'd cut and run for instance i wouldn't have have grieved over much at the loss of the two dagos thereupon we fell silent for to outshout the yell of the wind and the roar of the sea was no easy matter moreover the loss of those three men set me thinking and on top of that the ship needed most careful watching for in light trim as she was there were moments when the rudder seemed to lose control of her and then it taxed our skill and strength to the utmost to prevent her broaching to which would have meant the end of her and of all hands i shall never forget that night so long as i live never before had i known it blow anything like so hard the wind smote one like something solid and with such tremendous force that to have stood up unsupported against the pressure of it would have been impossible if it had been blowing say half as hard as it actually was there would have been a terrific sea running but far from this being the case the surface of the ocean was as flat as a billiard table the slightest roughness being instantly seized by the wind and swept away to leeward in the form of scud water then there was the appalling unnatural darkness through which the ship was rushing at a speed which i am certain she had never before attained the only mitigating circumstance was that the wind-lashed sea emitted a certain ghostly radiance that despite the deluge of spindrift and scud-water with which the air was saturated enabled one dimly to discern objects as far forward as the foremast but to rush at the speed at which we were travelling into the heart of that pitchy blackness was nerve-racking work for although the chart assured us that we had a clear sea for some hundreds of miles ahead there were still such possibilities as derelicts to be reckoned with and under such circumstances as i have been endeavouring to describe if an obstacle of any sort should happen to be in our way to avoid it would be a sheer impossibility while to strike it would mean for us simply destruction i was anxiously considering the chance of such an eventuality when another terrific gust swooped down upon us the ship trembled and lurched forward as though she were about to plunge to the bottom and have done with it i heard a loud crack behind me and simultaneously received a terrible blow on the back of the head then 
oblivion a dull aching throbbing pain at the back of my head was the sensation of which i was first conscious upon waking from what seemed to have been a sleep haunted by innumerable harrowing nightmares then before i had time to fully realize that i was once more awake and free from the torment of those dreadful nightmares i became aware of two things first that a soft warm salt-laden breeze was gently fanning my face and affording me much refreshment and next that the air was vibrant with the deep booming thunder of heavily breaking surf i was aware also that i was in bed and that apart from my throbbing headache i was quite comfortable and for perhaps two or three minutes i remained as i was quiescent enjoying the sensation of comfort quite oblivious of everything else then it suddenly occurred to me to wonder where i was what was the matter with my head and back came the memory of that awful night of hurricane that terrible blow on the back of my head and opening my eyes i started up with an inarticulate cry that is to say i attempted to start up but failed my body felt like lead i had no strength to move it and after a moment's ineffectual struggle i abandoned the attempt and let my head sink back upon the pillow as i did so i became aware of a slight movement at my side and glancing in that direction i saw the boy billy bending over me with an expression of deep anxiety in his eyes as he continued to gaze the expression of anxiety gave place to one of satisfaction and he said oh that's better mr blackburn i believe you're not going to die yet after all going to die i reiterated have i been ill then you have and no mistake emphatically asserted the boy for four days and nights you have been just raving and all the while you refused to take anything but an occasional drink of water no wonder you found yourself too weak to rise just now by jove ejaculated i you amaze me billy but i am puzzled i am in my own bunk in my own cabin there is a nice breeze blowing for i can feel it coming through the open scuttle and i hear the seething of water along the ship's side yet i'll swear she is not moving an inch what is the explanation i'll tell you in a minute or two answered billy but first let me get you some broth for i can see that you're about done up and need something to strengthen you i thought this morning that you seemed a bit different and when you stopped raving and dropped off to sleep i seized the chance to get something ready for you against the time when you woke up i'll fetch it in half a jiffy so saying billy disappeared into the main cabin returning a minute or two later with a bowl of steaming hot savory smelling soup with which after propping me up with cushions he cautiously fed me a little at a time until he thought i had taken as much as was good for me then removing the cushions he lowered me gently back into a reclining position made me comfortable and seating himself by my bedside proceeded to make me acquainted with the happenings succeeding my accident end of chapter six Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. Chapter 7 of The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by harry collingwood chapter seven billy tells how we became wrecked my word began billy i shan't forget in a hurry the awful look of the sky that night when you ordered me to come below and i heard you slam the companion doors behind me and draw over the slide i felt certain that with a sky blazing like that when it was getting on toward the middle of the night something dreadful was going to happen and it did didn't it i was frightened enough to start with but when you battened me down i tell you mr blackburn i was fairly terrified and two or three times i climbed halfway up the companion stairs intendin to shout to you to let me out 
then i thought again that you wouldn't have sent me below if you hadn't known it was the best place for me so i crept back again and curled up on the locker cushions and then came the hurricane i heard it even before it struck the ship and when it hit her and i felt her shiver i made sure that it was all up with us and knelt down on the cabin floor and kept on saying my prayers over and over again i was still saying em when i suddenly heard the slide pushed back and the companion doors flung open there was a scuffling of feet on the stairs and i heard enderby and chips warnin one another to be careful then they came into the cabin carryin you between em and they laid you on the cabin table and said you'd met with an accident and i saw that your head was bleedin they undressed you all in a hurry put you in your bunk told me to look after you and then rushed up on deck again shuttin me in just as you did you were insensible then so i got to work and hunted up some stuff to make bandages with then i opened the medicine chest and got out the book of instructions and while i was trying to find out what was the proper thing to do i heard the bosun and chips shoutin something i listened trying to hear what they were shoutin about and then above the noise of the wind i heard another sound like well i can hardly describe it but you can hear it now the roar of the surf on the reef it grew louder and louder still until it was well just deafening then i felt the ship hove first up and then down then she touched something but didn't seem to hit it very hard i felt a blow like a heavy sea hitting her i heard the fall and rush of water on her deck and a crash that sounded as if the mainmast had gone over the side then she struck again harder three or four times heeling over until she seemed to be on her beam ends and flinging me right across the cabin floor and all the time i could hear that she was being swept by awfully heavy seas but after a bit things got rather more quiet i felt that we were aground but still rolling heavily and i could hear at every roll a sort of crunching sound as though the planking of the ship's bottom was grinding upon something but the seas weren't coming aboard now nearly so heavy nor as often as they were and after a time they didn't come aboard at all the rocking motion eased up and i thought from the sound that it didn't seem to be blowing quite so hard all this time you were in your bunk insensible but as soon as i was able to stand without being flung down again i got some water from the pantry filter and bathed your head there was a nasty cut in it and it was still bleeding but i washed it as well as i could and made a pad that i bound tightly over it according to the directions i found in the book and then i think i must have fallen asleep for i don't remember anything more happening until i awoke and saw the sun shinin through your scuttle and the cabin skylight you were still insensible so i bathed your head afresh put a new dressing on it and then went on deck to have a look round my word mr blackburn i was astonished when i pushed open the companion slide and looked out the ship is ashore on a reef a total wreck both masts gone by the board bulwarks carried away decks swept and everything but the galley gone and you and i are all that are left of the crew good heavens billy you surely don't mean to say that all hands except ourselves are lost i exclaimed in horrified tones yes i do mr blackburn protested the boy and you wouldn't be surprised if you had heard as i did the tremendous seas that swept the ship when she first hit the reef i shouldn't have been a bit surprised if she had gone to pieces right then it's no wonder that the decks were clean swept no wonder indeed i agreed you say that we are ashore on a reef billy what sort of a reef is it just ordinary rocks or no answered billy it's not just jagged seaweed covered rocks but all white almost like marble a little bit rough and uneven but not like the rocks we get at home this reef seems to be all in a piece like a great tremendously thick wall yes i interrupted 
I think I understand. It is probably a coral reef. How far does it extend? How far? reiterated Billy. Why, pointing, it comes from away over there, as far as you can see, and stretches right across to as far as you can see on the other side. Aye, I agreed, a coral reef, without a doubt. And how much water is there alongside? Not more than two or three feet at most, answered Billy. We're standing a lot higher out of the water than when we were afloat. When I first noticed it, I thought it was because it happened to be low water when I looked. But it isn't that, because it's always pretty nearly the same. I don't think there's a difference of more than just a few inches between high and low water. In that case, I commented, as much to myself as to my companion, the explanation probably is that when we hit the reef, the sea was heaped up by the gale considerably above its usual level, and that it has now subsided again, leaving us nearly high and dry. Now, Billy, is there any land in sight? If so, what does it look like? Billy considered for a moment or two, evidently conjuring up a mental picture. Then he answered, First, about two miles off, there's a beach of very white sand. Then there's a lot of trees, palm trees I think they must be, growing all along the inner edge of the beach, and behind them bushes and more trees, thousands, millions of them, all sorts of colors, white, yellow, green, red, purple, but I don't remember seeing any that were really black. Is there a mountain on the island? I asked. Well, no, not exactly what you'd call a mountain, I think but there are plenty of fairly high hills, answered Billy. And how big do you suppose the island to be? I asked. How big? repeated Billy. Oh, really, I don't know. Quite a big place, I'd say. It stretches athwart our bows as far as you can see, both ways. The dickens it does, I exclaimed. That is very extraordinary. I cannot understand it. At that rate the island must be at least thirty miles long. Yet there is no such island shown on the chart, no island of any sort indeed, large or small, just where we are. Yet I have been under the impression that these seas have been thoroughly surveyed. The main fact, however, and the one most important to us, is that we are here, and with very little prospect, I fear, of getting away again for some time. I must turn out and begin to get busy. There is evidently no time to waste. Billy, please find me my clothes. Billy regarded me gravely, then shook his head. That's all very well, Mr. Blackburn, he said. But what's the good of talking about turning out when you haven't even got strength enough to lift yourself up in bed? No, sir, please don't attempt to do anything so foolish. You'd only fall and hurt yourself worse. What you've got to do is to get well as quick as ever you can, and the best way to do that is to stay where you are until you've got your strength again. And I'll help you all I can. I'll feed you up and look after you and tell you everything that happens. But please, please don't be in too great a hurry. This is a case of the more hurry, the less speed. I'm sure of it. Only trust yourself to me, Mr. Blackburn and I'll get you well as quick as ever I can. By Jove, Billy, said I, I believe you will. You have done marvelously well thus far. Why, boy, you must have been born to become a great physician, and you talk more wisely than many lads of twice your age. Yes, I will trust myself absolutely to you. But now that I come to look at you, your eyes are so heavy with sleeplessness that you seem scarcely able to keep them open. How have you managed to sleep while I have been ill? Oh, answered Billy, I've done pretty well. When you've been quiet for a bit, I've stretched myself out on the sofa and slept until you woke me up with your raven. But now that you've come to your senses, I expect I shall be able to get a really good rest. I hope you will, said I, and there's no time like the present. So, as I am feeling very comfortable just now, and much inclined to sleep, go and turn in, and get that really good rest that you spoke of. Leave open the door of my stateroom, and that of your own, and, if I need anything, I'll call out for you. 
thanks to the tireless attention with which billy tended me and the meticulous care with which he followed the instructions set forth in the book of directions attached to the ship's medicine chest for such a case as mine i was not again troubled with delirium nor did i experience any other setback of any kind on the contrary i made such excellent progress that within the fortnight i was able to be up and about again although it was something of a task to climb the companion stairway to the deck even with the help of billy but that task once achieved i made rapid headway and was soon my old self again upon my first visit to the deck after my illness i sustained something of a shock my last view of the brigantine had shown her all a tonto and although what billy had told me ought to have prepared me for the change that met my gaze i must confess that i was distinctly taken aback when upon my first emergence from the companion i beheld both masts gone by the board all the bulwarks swept away and the deck hampered by a confused mass of raffle consisting of the mainmast with all attached stretched fore and aft while the foremast had gone over the bows its head resting upon the coral while its splintered lower extremity projected some ten feet above the night heads the fore topmast had carried away close to the cap and with the yards was afloat under the bows fast to the wreck by the standing and running rigging the lifeboat that had served me so well had practically disappeared only the keel and a fragment of the stern post remaining but by a miracle the galley remained intact and was in regular use by billy for the preparation of our meals almost my first care was to sound the well in the hope that by some stroke of marvellous good fortune the hull might have so far escaped serious damage and be capable of being floated again but of course that was too much to expect i found nearly two and a half feet of water in the well which was about the depth alongside the inference therefore was that upon striking the reef the ship had been bilged or some of her planks had been started and that therefore if it depended upon my efforts alone she would never float again i next turned my attention to externals helped by billy i tottered to the skylight and seated myself upon the cover from which i obtained a clear view of the whole reef from horizon to horizon it appeared to be a typical example of a coral barrier reef running roughly parallel to the shore of the island from north to south but it seemed to vary greatly in width for while in some places i judged it to be not more than five or six yards wide it was nearly or quite three hundred yards wide where the brigantine lay and most fortunate was it for us that it was so for if after striking the ship had been driven over the inner edge of the reef to the comparatively deep water of the lagoon she would assuredly have gone down taking us with her as it was there was a space of only about a fathom between our forefoot and the inner edge of the reef as i ascertained later the great wall of surf fifty feet high breaking perpetually upon the outer face of the reef and stretching mile after mile to north and south of us was a wonderful sight especially in the early morning when the sun's rays struck the great cloud of spray creating a most beautiful and perfect rainbow that same wall of spray by the way effectually excluded all view of the ocean outside so that even if a whole navy happened to be passing we should never catch the smallest glimpse of it so long as we remained aboard the wreck it was evident therefore that the first step toward an escape from our present predicament must be the transfer of ourselves and everything of value to the island by a natural transition of thought i next turned my attention to the land which stretched north and south athwart the bows of the wreck a great belt of smooth water averaging some two miles in width lay between the reef and the beach of dazzling white sand both extending to right and left as far as the eye could see to the south the land seemed to dip out of sight below the horizon but northward it appeared to terminate in a high headland which i estimated to be about eighteen miles distant i considered therefore 
that the island must measure from north to south at least forty miles what it might measure from east to west was not to be easily determined but the summits of the most distant range of hills appeared to be nearly or quite twenty miles distant and how much land lay between them it was of course impossible to guess the description of the island which billy had given me several days earlier was quite a good one there was the far-stretching ribbon of white beach bordered on its inshore margin by innumerable coconut palms beyond which the land rose gently in irregular folds to the hills in the rear every inch of soil apparently being clothed with vegetation of some sort chiefly trees many of which seemed as seen through the ship's telescope to be smothered in blossoms of varied and most beautiful hues i subjected every foot of the land in sight to a most rigorous scrutiny through the lenses of the telescope in search of some indication of inhabitants but could find nothing no cleared and cultivated land no smoke suggestive of dwellings no canoes on the beach no moving figures to all appearances indeed the gulls pelicans and other aquatic birds that wheeled and screamed over the lagoon and dived into its waters might be the only life on the island well mr blackburn what do you think of it demanded billy when at length i lowered the telescope from my eye it is wonderful i declared i am amazed i simply cannot understand it that island is quite a big place there is nothing in the least like it shown on the chart anywhere near the spot which it actually occupies yet how it has so far escaped the notice of the hydrographers is a puzzle to me the matter however which most concerns us is that viewed from here at least it appears to be a sufficiently desirable place on which we ought without difficulty to find ample means of subsistence how does the idea of living ashore there for a time appeal to you oh i say exclaimed billy that will be splendid just think of the jolly times we shall be able to have huntin wild beasts fightin the savages and havin all sorts of splendid adventures well i said some of those things may possibly come our way but we really want no excitements of that sort billy boy of course we are all right where we are so long as the wreck holds together and remains habitable but the trouble is that we don't know how long that may be another such gale as placed us here might send such a tremendous sea pouring in over the reef as to wash the old hooker off the reef into the lagoon where she would quickly founder which is the reason why i consider that we must establish ourselves ashore as soon as possible oh exclaimed billy i never thought of that do you really think mr blackburn that there's a chance of the wreck sinking it is quite possible i replied although i have known cases where stranded wrecks have remained for years undisturbed still the possibility must be recognized and provided against wherefore it is of the utmost importance that we lose no time in getting ourselves safely settled ashore then what do you propose to do sir demanded billy the moment that i am strong enough to do any work said i i shall start to build some sort of a craft in which we can ferry ourselves across the lagoon and explore the island in search of a suitable spot upon which to pitch our camp after that everything will depend upon the conditions on which we find it possible to live but one condition is of paramount importance we must establish ourselves where a clear view of the open sea can be obtained and from which it will be possible to signal to any ship that may heave in sight and now billy do you happen to know whether there is any timber aboard out of which it would be possible for me to build a boat without the preliminary necessity to start breaking up the yorkshire lass why yes i i believe there is answered billy hesitatingly i can't say for certain but i seem to remember hearing dad say something about buying some planks as a standby in case of repairs of any sort being needed and i believe i saw some planks and scatlin down in the forehold a bit later while the ship was still in dock if the timber's aboard anywhere that's where you'll find it mr blackburn thanks billy said i 
as soon as i am strong enough to lift a hatch we will explore the forehold and see what is to be found there nearly a fortnight elapsed before i was strong enough to open the fore hatchway even with billy's help but when at length we managed it we were amply rewarded for our labor an abundant supply of planks and scatlin for our utmost need being found i took careful stock of it all recording the nature and dimensions of each piece of scantling and plank and then providing myself with paper pencil and scale i set to work to scheme out a craft that should be easy to build fast stiff and weatherly under canvas a fairly good sea-boat and of light draught it was a decidedly ambitious scheme for an individual who up to then had attempted nothing bigger than a three-foot model but even that experience was i soon found of great value to me and ultimately i evolved a design that i believe would approach within a reasonable distance of my requirements this done i routed out the carpenter's chest of tools from the forecastle cleaned and sharpened them got up on deck such timber as i immediately required and started work with billy as an enthusiastic helpmate End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of the Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood. Chapter Eight We Go Exploring and Meet with an Adventure. It cost Billy and me nearly three months of strenuous labour to build our boat, rig her, and get her afloat. Then, upon a certain day, the boy and I, provided with a rifle apiece, a brace of revolvers, and an abundant supply of cartridges for each kind of weapon, climbed down the side of the wreck into our completed craft, set her sails, and pushed off on our first voyage of exploration. The wind was, as usual, blowing a moderate breeze from the eastward when we started. Consequently, the island lay dead to windward, a beat of two miles to the nearest point of the beach, thus affording an excellent opportunity to test the weatherly qualities of the boat. And I was agreeably surprised, not only at the style in which she turned to windward, but also at the speed with which she slipped through the water and the certainty and serenity with which she stayed. She made the distance in a few minutes over the half-hour, which, considering that as we drew in under the land the wind grew ever more scanty, I regarded as a very creditable performance. As we shortened the distance between ourselves and the land, the prospect grew ever more attractive, eliciting frequent exclamations of delight from Billy, the ground now revealed itself as finely broken into a range of lofty hills of gracefully flowing outline, with suggestions of picturesque valleys winding between them, affording an infinite variety of glowing light and soft shadow, while the variegated and brilliant hues of the foliage completed a picture of indescribable beauty. But all this beauty by no means exhausted the charm of the place, for as we drew still closer to the beach, we were able to distinguish that the woods were the habitat of countless thousands of birds of strange and most gorgeous plumage, among which I identified what I believed to be three or four species of birds of paradise, as well as a great variety of sunbirds flitting from flower to flower like living gems. It is to be admitted that the cries of those birds were not always in accord with the splendour of their plumage, being for the most part distinctly harsh and unmusical. But there was one exception that startled us not a little when we first heard it. Its cry was an exact reproduction of the sound of a sweet-toned bell, so exact indeed that for the moment I felt fully persuaded that, hidden somewhere in the heart of that vast ocean of greenery, there must be a monastery, or some such institution, 
and it was not until we marked the irregular, intermittent character of the sounds, and the fact that they emanated from frequently changing localities, that we at length arrived at an explanation of the apparent mystery. While we were still discussing the matter, the boat gently grounded upon the dazzlingly white beach of coral sand, and we stepped out, securing the boat by means of a grapnel attached to the end of a long painter, digging the flukes of the former deeply into the sand. Then Billy and I, each carrying the weapons with which we had provided ourselves, set out to explore the new territory. The beach was of varying width, ranging from two or three yards to, in places, nothing at all. Indeed, many of the cocoa-nut trees were actually rooted in soil that was, at the moment, being laved by the salt water, due to the fact that we happened to land about the time of full tide. It happened also that the fruit was at that season just ripening, so many of the nuts falling to the ground with a thud, even as we stood staring about us, that we were able without difficulty to collect and place in the boat as many as we pleased. This done, we attempted to make our way inland, but so dense was the undergrowth at that point that we were soon compelled to abandon our efforts, it being clearly evident that the only way in which we could penetrate would be by hewing a path for ourselves. But it did not follow that because we failed here, we must necessarily fail everywhere. We therefore re-embarked, and again getting under way, headed northward, keeping close to the beach, and maintaining a good lookout for a spot affording a reasonable prospect of successful penetration. Several times we believed we had found what we were seeking, but on each occasion our hopes were speedily dashed, our most successful effort resulting merely in penetration for a distance of less than half a mile. But even so, our attempts were not unmitigated failures, for while our clothing suffered somewhat in our encounters with the thorns that persistently barred our passage, we were fortunate enough to secure a few bunches of delicious wild grapes, a large bunch of very delicately flavoured bananas, and six splendid pineapples. Upon our return to the beach, I took the precaution to mark the spot by cutting a good big branch and inserting it upright in the sand so that it could easily be seen at some distance, and then we resumed our voyage of exploration, lunching luxuriously upon bananas, meanwhile. At length, after working northward for a distance of some fourteen miles along the western shore, we quite suddenly opened out the mouth of what I at first supposed to be an important river, running in a southeasterly direction toward the interior of the island, but which subsequently proved to be one of several channels dividing what I originally imagined to be only one island into a group of no less than seven. Naturally, I at once decided to abandon for the moment the further exploration of the lagoon in favour of a survey of this waterway, and the boat was accordingly put about and headed into it. At its entrance it measured about half a mile wide, but as we proceeded it gradually widened out until, at a point about eight miles inward from the lagoon, it was quite two and a half miles wide. Here the channel trended a point or two farther to the eastward, and some four miles farther on it forked, one branch continuing to the south-eastward, while the other trended away toward the northeast. I decided to follow the latter. The land on both sides was still distinctly hilly and densely covered with forest, but on our left the hills sloped rapidly downward until they died away in a plateau, the level of which was only two or three feet above the surface of the water. As the boat glided slowly onward, under the influence of a breeze, that had steadily grown more languid and fitful as we progressed, we subjected this plateau to a rigorous scrutiny through the ship's telescope, which we carried with us, but the place looked so uninviting 
that we decided against landing there. Nor did the land to the southward look any more inviting, for it consisted of cliffs ranging from two hundred to five or six hundred feet high, rising almost vertically from the water. We therefore pushed on, all the more impelled thereto, because the channel now ran almost directly to windward, and we were therefore obliged to beat up through it. Moreover, the afternoon was progressing, and I wanted, if possible, to find some spot where we could pass the night in comfort. At a point some eight miles further on, the channel again forked, one branch heading away to the northeast, while the other trended off in a southeasterly direction. As we reached this point, the wind suddenly freshened, and there was a salt tang in it, quite distinctive from the odour of earth and vegetation that we had now been breathing for several hours. Also there came to our ears, subdued by distance, the low, continuous, booming thunder of surf, from which I surmised, correctly as it subsequently proved, that we were nearing the eastern extremity of the group. Heading the boat into the southeastern channel, with a long range of vertical rocky cliffs still stretching away on our starboard bow, we presently came abreast of an island measuring some six miles from east to west, by about seven miles from north to south, roughly triangular in plan, the surface sloping upward on all sides from the water's edge to a peak which I estimated to be about two thousand feet high. Standing close in shore, to get as near a view as possible of this island, we found its appearance most delectable. Like much of what we had already seen, the entire island was forest-clad, but the country was much more park-like in character. The trees grew less thickly together, they were not matted together by an impenetrable jungle of undergrowth, although many of them were almost smothered in what appeared to be innumerable varieties of orchids, and the soil was clothed with what looked like short grey-green grass, down to the inner edge of the narrow beach, which was lined with cocoa-nut palms. Taken altogether, the place wore so exceedingly attractive an appearance that, finding ourselves rather unexpectedly standing in a nice snug little bay, I headed straight away for the beach, determined to push our explorations no farther for that day. Securely mooring the boat as before, we landed, and fully armed, made our way inland, over the southern shoulder of the hill, observing, as we went, that among the forest giants that towered about us on every hand, there were fruit trees in abundance, among which I identified the breadfruit, the mango, the custard apple, the shaddock, or grapefruit, grape vines twining about many of the bigger trees, and yielding large clusters of richly flavoured fruit, while bananas and plantains were to be seen wherever one turned one's eyes. Birds also seemed to regard this island as a desirable dwelling place, for they were everywhere, their beautiful plumage adding a further charm to the little island paradise. From the beach to the ridge of the hill, for which we were making, the distance was about a mile, the ground rising gently all the way, but the going was comparatively easy, for, by making slight detours here and there, we were able to progress without the need to force our way through dense undergrowth. A gentle saunter of about half an hour's duration therefore took us to the point for which I was aiming. Arrived there, we were afforded a clear view eastward, when we discovered, as I had suspected, that we had practically reached the eastern extremity of the group. Immediately before us, the ground sloped down to the eastern shore, its distance being about a mile. That shore was washed by the waters of the lagoon, which was at this point some six or seven miles wide, its outer margin being marked by a continuous wall of spray thrown up by the long lines of Pacific swell that eternally hurled themselves upon the barrier reef. And midway between that reef and the island on which we stood, there was a smaller island, 
which in all essentials appeared to be a replica of the one we were on for it too was park-like in the arrangement of the trees that grew upon it while it also boasted a central peak rising to a height of some six or seven hundred feet this small island it was evident was the easternmost of the whole group and i at once determined to pay it a visit early on the morrow for if it should prove upon inspection to be as desirable as it looked it would certainly be the place on which we ought to take up our abode since from it we should best be able to signal any ship that might heave into sight and from which also if an opening in the reef happened to be anywhere handy we could slip out to sea in our boat and if need be intercept that ship south of us and on the opposite side of a channel about three-quarters of a mile wide lay the curious island of the vertical cliffs already referred to from the viewpoint which we occupied we could see the entire length of this island which i estimated at about sixteen miles its eastern extremity being a low cliff some eight miles south-east of us i resolved that on the morrow after visiting the small island to the eastward of us which i had already begun to speak of as ours i would pay a visit to this other island which somehow seemed to have invested itself in my eyes with an air of mystery we spent that night encamped on the grass close to the beach occupying a tent formed of an old sail and three oars which i had brought along for the purpose and we slept soundly the night air on the eastern side of the group being as we discovered very much fresher and cooler than on the western side where the wreck lay we were astir by sunrise next morning treating ourselves to a swim in the bay after which we proceeded to prepare breakfast when we had finished the meal we struck the tent packed it away in the boat and started upon another day's exploration our first call was at the small island forming the easternmost extremity of the group which i had practically determined upon as our place of abode during such time as fate might keep us prisoners on the group and we found it almost ideal for our purpose in the first place there was on its southwestern side a snug little cove just large enough to accommodate our boat and wherein she might ride safely in all weathers next discharging into this cove there was a brook of deliciously cool sweet water springing from the side of the cove affording us an ample supply for every purpose the island was rich in fruit trees of great variety and finally a rigorous examination of it failed to disclose the existence upon it of anything noxious or inimical to human life although like the other islands visited the place swarmed with birds to crown all and complete my satisfaction we found that there was a passage through the reef immediately to the eastward of the island through which in our boat we might reach the open sea we spent the entire morning on our island and partook of our midday meal there leaving it rather reluctantly to continue our survey of the group the island which i next intended to visit was the one with the vertical cliffs along which we had coasted on the previous day those rugged precipitous cliffs formed the northern coastline of the island but from certain observations which i had made from our own island i came to the conclusion that the southern side of the island would reveal very dissimilar characteristics and so it proved for when after a sail of some six miles in a southerly direction we rounded its southeastern extremity we discovered that its southern shore rose only a few feet above the level of the water being bounded as seemed usual in the group by a narrow beach of coral sand liberally fringed with coconut trees the ground sloping gently up from the beach for a distance ranging from two to four miles when it abruptly ended against the southern face of the cliffs to which i have so frequently referred 
but this was by no means its most surprising characteristic to us explorers for having thus far failed to discover any sign of inhabitants i had perhaps rather hastily jumped to the conclusion that the group was uninhabited whereas we now saw that the whole surface of this particular island from its southern shore right up to the base of its range of northern cliffs was under cultivation wide areas of indian corn were interspersed with spacious fields of sugar-cane varied here and there by great orchards of what i assumed to be fruit trees of various kinds and what appeared to be garden plots devoted to the cultivation of vegetables occasionally we caught glimpses of the natives working either singly or in small groups in the fields orchards and gardens and from their gestures of amazement and from the manner in which they stood transfixed and staring when our boats swept within their range of vision i conjectured that it was the first time in their lives that they had ever beheld such a sight they were almost coal-black in colour and inspection of them through the telescope showed them to be absolutely naked wherefore i decided not to pay them a visit until some future occasion when billy should not be with me although apart from their state of nudity they impressed me as being perfectly harmless my resolve to abstain from landing there on that occasion was however broken down within the next half hour and that too in a sufficiently remarkable and tragic manner we were skimming briskly along before the pleasant easterly breeze billy being at the helm while i sat in the bottom of the boat taking peeps through the telescope at interesting objects in the landscape that seemed to be gliding past us when suddenly we heard from some distance ahead of us a sound as of a horn being blown the sound being taken up and repeated at various points both ahead and astern of us what do you think is the meaning of that rumpus mr blackburn asked billy do you think they're scared at the sight of us looks a bit like it doesn't it but see sir they've all started to run i directed the telescope toward the shore it was as billy had said everybody within sight was running and at remarkable speed too but whether or not it was the apparition of the boat that had startled them i could not tell for about half of them seemed to be hastening at breakneck speed toward a part of the beach about half a mile ahead where a group of some forty or fifty blacks had already gathered close to the water's edge and seemed to be engaged in feverish haste in collecting stones or lumps of coral other groups which i believed to be composed of women were running with equal speed toward the cliffs at the back of the island turning my telescope again upon the rapidly gathering natives on the beach i saw that it could not be the boat that was causing their excitement for a number of them having collected as many stones as could be conveniently held in the hollow of the left arm were now excitedly pointing and directing their companions attention to some object in the channel immediately before them turning the telescope in that direction toward which they were pointing i presently sighted three objects that i believed to be the heads of animals making rapid progress through the water toward that point on the beach where the still rapidly swelling crowd had collected and as i watched little jets of water began to spout up round the foremost of those heads the blacks were stoning it with the evident object of driving it off or at least preventing its approach and remarkably good marksmen they appeared to be too for as i continued to watch i observed four or five direct hits evoking from the target a most appalling shrieking roar while its progress through the water perceptibly speeded up that the three swimming creatures had been recognized by the blacks as enemies possibly of long standing was clear enough and here it appeared to me was an excellent opportunity for me to establish good relations between ourselves and the savages by taking a hand in the game that was evidently toward i accordingly laid down the telescope and as i reached for the rifles directed billy to luff and head the boat straight for the spot where the blacks were gathered as i rapidly threw open the breeches of the rifles 
to assure myself that the weapons were loaded, the leading swimmer reached shallow water, and rising to its feet, revealed itself as a gigantic anthropoid ape, probably a species of gorilla. The creature towered a clear head and shoulders in stature above the natives. It had a comparatively small head, with a flat receding forehead, very wide nostrils, a long, enormously muscular body, immensely wide across its massive shoulders, disproportionately short legs, and huge arms so long that even when the brute stood upright, its clenched fists reached to within a foot of the ground. As it started to wade ashore, its advance was momentarily checked by a terrific volley of stones, hurled with amazing force and precision. Then, emitting a series of those dreadful shrieking roars, it dashed forward with outstretched arms, seized the nearest native, and without apparent effort, literally tore the unfortunate man's head from his body. It was evident that if I meant to intervene to any good purpose, there was not a moment to lose. The boat was now within a hundred yards of the spot where the battle between the ape and the natives was raging. But I dared not risk a shot in that quarter, for the great brute, still roaring horribly, was completely hemmed in by a crowd of natives, all battering the huge, hairy body with big lumps of coral, and the movements of the combatants were so quick that I was more likely to hit a black than the beast. But the second ape was now in shallow water, and on the point of rising to its feet. I therefore levelled the rifle I held, and pressed the trigger as the two sights of the weapon came into line with the centre of the head, just above the ear. A harrowing shriek pealed out on the hot air, and as the little puff of smoke from the rifle blew away, I had the satisfaction of seeing the creature throw up its great hands and sink back into the water, dead. Dropping the empty weapon, I snatched up the loaded one and threw a quick glance around to decide which should be my next mark. The third ape was now less than twenty yards distant, and as my gaze fell upon him, I saw him change his course and head for the boat. This afforded me the opportunity I wanted, and levelling my weapon, I aimed for the centre of the forehead and fired. I distinctly heard the thud of the bullet as it crashed into the massive skull. But there was no shriek this time. The beast simply collapsed and sank. Meanwhile, the aspect of affairs ashore had undergone a remarkable change. Whether it was the sharp crack of the rifles and the coincident death of the two apes, or the fact that the brute which had effected a landing had already put seven or eight of the natives hors de combat, I could not guess. But the natives had, apparently with one accord, and as though at a preconcerted signal, suddenly abandoned the fight and were now fleeing in all directions, while the ape, perhaps taken by surprise at the quick change of tactics, or possibly dazed by the severe blows that he had received, stood staring about him, as though undecided what to do next. But only for a moment, for just then the boat, with good way on, grounded and slid well up on the beach, while I rose to my feet and, leaping lightly over the bows, advanced toward the brute. Glancing quickly about him, the enormous beast instantly noted my movement, and with a deep, savage roar, turned to meet me. His little eyes blazing with fury, his lips drawn back in a snarl that exposed his formidable teeth and a pair of great tusks protruding from his lower jaw, with blood-stained foam dripping from his champing jaws and blood from numerous wounds streaking his great hairy hide, he presented a most formidable spectacle as he approached me with his body bent and crouching ready to spring, and his long sinewy arms outstretched, the great hands opening and closing, as though eager to clutch my throat. We were now within half a dozen yards of each other, and as though by mutual consent we each halted at the same instant, glaring into each other's eyes. I saw the beast crouch still lower, and noted the ripple of the muscles of the great loins as he gathered himself together for the spring 
that was to settle the dispute off-hand, and quickly levelling the revolver which I had drawn from my belt as I sprang ashore, I pointed the weapon straight for his head and pulled the trigger. There was a sharp click as the hammer fell, but no explosion. The cartridge had missed fire, and at that precise moment the brute made his leap. As he came hurtling at me through the air, I, by instinct, I suppose, for there was no time for reasoning, again pointed the revolver, this time straight at his wide-open mouth, and again pressed the trigger. On this occasion, the explosion came off all right. Then, while the report still rang in my ears, the huge body of the ape, with a curious writhing motion, crashed down upon me and dashed me violently to the ground. We fell side by side, I upon my back and the ape face downward. A convulsive shudder shook the body for a moment, and then it lay still. As for me, I remained where I had fallen, breathless, dazed, and half-stunned, until I was aroused by Billy, who, springing ashore, rushed up to ask anxiously whether I was very much hurt. Fortunately, I was not. I was scarcely even bruised by my fall, and I scrambled to my feet not a penny the worse for my rather grim encounter. I lingered on the beach for nearly half an hour, in the expectation that some of the natives might possibly return, and thus afford me an opportunity to establish something in the nature of amicable relations with them. But none of them did. Eventually, therefore, I got the boat afloat again, and made sail on our way back to the wreck, abandoning for the moment all idea of further exploration. End of chapter 8「The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood Chapter 9 We Settle Down on Eden We found the wreck as, of course, we had quite expected, in precisely the same condition as we had left her. As I stowed the boat's sails and made her securely fast to the wreck, it was my fixed intention to continue our exploration on the following day. But as I sat on deck that night, smoking a final pipe before turning in, my plans underwent a certain amount of modification. I had quite come to the conclusion that the tiny islet that formed the easternmost extremity of the group was the spot on which we ought to take up our abode in view of our hope of eventual rescue. And while considering the matter, it also occurred to me that since it was impossible to forecast the duration of our detention upon the group, it might run to months, for aught that I could tell, a reasonably comfortable dwelling of some sort, Something less susceptible to the vicissitudes of weather than a mere tent, for instance, was an absolute necessity. I therefore spent the ensuing four days in planning such a house as Billy and I might, between us, be able to construct, and by the end of that time I had got it satisfactorily planned out on paper. I determined to build it entirely of wood. First, because the wreck afforded us abundance of material, and next, because I could do all the cutting out, the sawing, planing, mortising, and fitting aboard the ship, where such tools and conveniences as we possessed were at immediate command, and where I could work from early morn to dewy eve without fear of interruption of any kind. Then, when all my timbers were cut, shaped, and fitted, it would be a comparatively simple matter to transfer them to the islet by means of the boat and there erect them and fit them together. From such observations as I had already been able to make, I had come to the conclusion that the barrier reef upon which the Yorkshire lass lay stranded 
would probably be found to encircle the group completely, with, perhaps, a breach or two in it somewhere. And as the determination of this point seemed to me a matter of some importance, I decided that our next exploration should be conducted with that object. Accordingly, upon the morning of the fifth day after our first expedition, we again left the wreck, the boat being well stocked with everything we could think of as likely to be required during a week's cruise. As before, we started by steering a northerly course, and in due time arrived off the entrance of the channel which we had explored on our first trip and which had proved to lead to the centre of the group. But on this occasion, instead of entering the channel as before, I continued to push northward, the barrier reef still holding intact on our port hand, while to starboard lay what proved to be the most northerly island of the group. As we coasted along its northwesterly shore, we were able to see that, while the southern portion of it was low and flat, a range of hills occupied its eastern side while another less lofty and less extensive range marked its northwestern extremity. But the land looked savage, unattractive, uninviting. We therefore made no attempt to land, contenting ourselves with the maintenance of a strict and continuous scrutiny of the country through the telescope. Uninviting, however, as was the aspect of the island, it became markedly more so when we were presently favoured with a glimpse of some of its inhabitants, of which, thus far, we had seen nothing. We had just rounded the headland that was the most northerly point of the group visible from the deck of the Yorkshire Lass, and had hauled up close to the wind to fetch another point, some four miles distant to the north-eastward, when, scrutinising the shore through the telescope, I saw two creatures suddenly burst through the dense scrub that seemed to be the only form of vegetation growing thereabout, and begin, or possibly, it might have been continue, what had all the appearance of a desperate fight on the open beach. We were at that moment not more than a quarter of a mile from the shore, and but little farther than that from the spot where the fight was taking place. The creatures, therefore, were in plain view of us, while the telescope clearly revealed every detail of what was happening and of the creatures themselves, but so incredibly agile were they in their movements that several minutes elapsed before I was able to do more than just form a rough estimate of their size. But presently the boat drew up fairly abreast of them, and then I directed Billy, who was steering, to haul the fore sheet to windward to deaden the boat's way, for I was curious to see what would be the outcome of the struggle. The combatants were well matched as to size and activity, there appearing to be not a pin to choose between them in those respects. I set them down to be about the same size as an ordinary donkey, but they did not in the least resemble donkeys as to shape. Indeed, at first sight, they seemed to be more like giant frogs. That, however, was merely a first impression, for there presently occurred a momentary pause in the fight, presumably to enable them to get their second wind, and then I was enabled to note details accurately. Their hind legs were, proportionately, as long as those of frogs, but much more muscular, while their forelegs appeared to be not more than a foot long, all four extremities being armed with exceedingly stout and formidable claws. Unlike frogs, however, they boasted powerful tails, that seemed to serve very much the same purpose as that of the kangaroo, both as a weapon and a propellant. At the base, it was the same thickness as the body, tapering away to a point, and it appeared to be about the same length as the body. The head was, however, the most remarkable feature of the animal. When seen in profile, it was not unlike those of the apes we had encountered, but it was evidently even more formidable, for projecting from its nose was a stout, sharp horn, similar to that of a rhinoceros, while a pair of long tusks projected from its upper jaw. In colour, the animal was a greyish-brown, dark on the upper part of the body, fading to a dirty white on the lower. 
a serrated ridge of what might be loose skin ran along its back from the nape of the neck to the extremity of the tail and the body appeared to be thickly dotted with wart-like excrescences altogether it had very much more the appearance of a reptile than of any other class of the animal kingdom these details i was able to observe during the short pause in the fight to which i have already alluded but in less than a minute the struggle was resumed with apparently greater ferocity than ever their method of fighting was as remarkable as their general appearance facing his opponent and crouching low at a distance of some three or four yards apart one of them would suddenly spring high in the air and land upon the body of his adversary striking furiously with claws tusks and tail while the other throwing himself on his back would lash out as vigorously with his own weapons then the two would grip rolling over and over each other and for a few minutes it would be impossible to see what was happening so quick were their movements and dense the cloud of dust that they raised then would occur a brief pause to be followed by a further renewal of the fight but after about a quarter of an hour it became evident that the struggle was nearly over the end came with dramatic suddenness the one which happened to be lying on his back made a lucky upward stroke with his hind claws disemboweling his antagonist as the latter descended upon him and a moment later he was tearing great morsels of flesh from the still writhing body of his late adversary let draw the fore sheet billy i exclaimed we'll get away from here as quickly as the wind will take us for the sight was a horrible and disgusting one an hour later we arrived off a gap about a mile wide between two headlands this gap forming the entrance of a noble bay some eight miles long by five miles wide at its widest part and curiously enough immediately opposite that gap there occurred a corresponding gap or break about two miles wide in the barrier reef so that had the place been known to mariners a ship in distress might have passed through this break in the reef and sailed straight into the bay even in the hardest gale that ever blew naturally i at once headed the boat into the bay and we sailed to its farther extremity hugging the western shore all the way and still maintaining a close watch upon the country generally through the telescope it was very rugged and broken until we reached the bottom of the bay where the hills from a height of some eight hundred feet sank into the plain the hillsides inside as outside the bay nourished a fairly dense growth of low coarse scrub that i searched with a glass in vain for any sign of life but i noticed very early after our passage between the two headlands that for some reason which i was quite unable to guess at the waters of the bay were swarming with sharks the first that we had seen since the occurrence of the wreck wherefore i at once christened the great sheet of water shark bay while to the island itself i gave the name of north island the headlands that guarded the entrance to shark bay were a pair of lofty promontories rising to a height of some four or five hundred feet forming part of the range of hills that engirdled the bay on either hand but while the range on the western side sloped down to the water's edge sinking into a plain at a distance of about ten miles from the entrance the range on the eastern side some sixteen miles long gradually receded from the shore line as it swept southwards the space between its foot and the beach being occupied by a swamp lying so low that it was difficult to judge in places the precise line of demarcation between land and water the southern half of the island consisted entirely of low flat ground sparsely covered with coarse grass and isolated clumps of scrub across which at a distance of some eight miles the high precipitous cliffs of the island where we encountered the apes could be distinctly seen 
by the time that we arrived at the inner or southern extremity of the bay the sun had declined to within a finger's width of the ridge of the western range of hills it was clear therefore that there could be no further exploration for us until the morrow and i began to look about in search of a suitable spot whereon to pitch our camp for the night and to choose seemed difficult the western shore of the bay with its broken ground and scrubby vegetation looked uninviting to say the least of it in addition to which it was on the other side of those same hills at a spot only a few miles distant that we had that afternoon witnessed the terrific fight between those two horrible unknown creatures and i had no inclination to place ourselves where we might perchance make closer acquaintance with other creatures of a similar or perhaps even more ferocious kind the eastern shore of the bay was a swamp and consequently out of the question i therefore turned my attention to the plain that formed the southern part of the island when looking in that direction i saw an animal of some sort squatting on its hind quarters on the beach staring at us it was only about a quarter of a mile distant and bringing the telescope to bear upon it i at once identified it as either the victorious fighter of the afternoon or a creature similar in every respect it was hardly likely to be the same beast however but i thought it doubtful whether the long arm of coincidence would bring the same creature within our ken again so soon moreover the animal at that moment focused by the lens of the telescope showed no wounds or other signs of recent battle i'll have a shot at the beggar if he will only remain as he is half a minute longer i exclaimed take the telescope billy and watch i'll aim for his heart and you will be able to see whether or not i score a hit and thrusting the telescope into billy's hands i snatched up a rifle four hundred and fifty yards should be about right i muttered as i adjusted the back sight of the weapon to that range then raising the rifle to my shoulder and bringing the sights into line on that part of the still motionless beast's body where i supposed its heart to be i pressed the trigger the plop of the bullet upon the creature's hide distinctly reached my ear a second or two after the crack of the rifle but instead of toppling over dead as i fully expected the beast simply wheeled about and in a sequence of enormous bounds quickly vanished in the distance by jove i exclaimed in amazement what an extraordinary thing i'll swear i hit him i had him as neatly covered as possible my hands were as steady as rocks and there is not enough wind to deflect the bullet furthermore i heard it strike yes so did i agreed billy i am certain that you hit the brute mr blackburn i can't say for certain that i actually saw the bullet hit but i believe that a second or two after you fired and an instant before the beast turned and bounded away i saw a tiny dark spot on the dirty white skin of its breast i wonder whether you really did or whether it was merely imagination said i anyway the beggar must be a tough one to kill for while i feel as certain as you do that i hit him the fact remains that he was very far from being dead when we last saw him furthermore that yonder plain harbours such creatures is a strong argument against our camping there to-night the only thing therefore that i can see for it is to stand off shore for a mile or two anchor the boat and rough it aboard her for the night which we did and ample reason had we to congratulate ourselves upon our decision for shortly after nightfall and all through the hours of darkness our ears were assailed by an almost continuous succession of such hair-raising shrieks and howls roars and bellowings as thoroughly convinced me that north island was no sort of dwelling place for human beings with a penchant for peace and quietness furthermore there was a moon that night well advanced in her second quarter and at frequent intervals during a particularly restless night 
I caught glimpses of shadowy forms moving restlessly hither and thither ashore. With the arrival of dawn next morning we were astir, and after an early breakfast the anchor was hove up and we got under way to resume our voyage of exploration. On the previous afternoon we pretty closely skirted the western bay of the shore. Now, on our way out, we as closely hugged the eastern shore, which I kept under continuous scrutiny with the help of the telescope. But nothing worthy of record was seen, and that day's voyage might be dismissed with the mere mention of it. But for the fact that when we were about halfway down the bay, we reached a spot where the water and the swamp were so intermingled that we actually ran right into a vast bed of rushes without grounding. There was, perhaps, nothing very remarkable about that, but there was a peculiarity about those rushes that Billy was the first to observe and remark upon, namely, their absolutely perfect straightness. This inspired me with an idea. Our stock of ammunition was limited, and when it should become exhausted, what were we to do? So long as we remained upon the group, we must have weapons of some sort, and the only substitute for the rifle and revolver that I could think of was the bow and arrow. I cut one of the rushes and found it to consist of an exceedingly hard outer casing filled with soft pith. It was remarkably light, and it instantly occurred to me that the smaller, thinner rushes, they ranged from about an eighth of an inch up to quite two inches in diameter, would make ideal arrows. We therefore set to work, there and then, and cut about two hundred reeds of suitable diameter, each of them being long enough to make at least two arrows. When, toward sunset that evening, we again reached the little islet that I had resolved to make our home, and which I named Eden, because it was so like a garden, the first thing we did was to spread our reeds out on the grass to dry. Next we rigged the tent, for we intended to spend the night on the island, and then Billy and I took a walk up as far as the shoulder of the hill, from which was to be obtained a view of the sea, upon the off chance of there being a sail of some sort in sight. But, as I more than half expected, the ocean was bare. We met with no adventures, unpleasant or otherwise, that night, but enjoyed several hours of sound, dreamless sleep, and awoke refreshed the next morning to pursue our voyage of exploration. Nor did we meet with any adventures worth recording on the third day of our voyage. We sailed past the eastern end of the island, inhabited by the natives, leaving it about two miles on our starboard hand as we steered south. Then we sailed past another and much bigger island, which I estimated to measure some sixteen miles long, by about fourteen miles wide. It was in the form of a double-coned hill, sloping on all sides down to the water's edge, the higher of the two cones being about nine hundred feet high, and the other perhaps two hundred feet less. It was thickly wooded from beach to summit, and I had no doubt that many of the trees we saw bore edible fruits, but we did not land to test the matter. Rather late in the afternoon, we arrived abreast another and much smaller island that proved to be the southernmost of the group. This we named South Island, and about sunset we ran into a tiny bay close to its western extremity, and anchoring the boat, passed the night in her, this time without disturbance of any kind. Continuing our circumnavigation of the group, we reached the wreck again about an hour before sunset on the fourth day of our travels, keeping within the lagoon all the time, and thus confirming my theory that the reef completely encircled the whole group. I estimated that in the course of those four days we sailed a distance of about 150 miles, but it was well worth it, for I now had considerable knowledge of the general characteristics of the entire group to which I could add when I set out to traverse the intersecting channels. 
the matter about which i was now most anxious was the erection of our projected house on our little islet of eden and to the cutting and shaping of the timber that was to be employed in its construction billy and i at once devoted ourselves energetically making remorseless inroads upon the wreck for the required materials but maintaining the cabins and after part of the ship intact that we might not deprive ourselves of the one dwelling place until the other was ready to receive us and i was all the more anxious to get this important piece of work completed without loss of time because i had a suspicion that in those latitudes there is what is known as a hurricane season during which extremely violent gales are prevalent and i knew that the very first of these when it came might destroy the wreck and so turn us out of house and home no sooner had we begun our work than i recognized the wisdom that had prompted me to prepare a carefully drawn detailed plan of our future house beforehand for now i was able to determine by reference to my plan the exact dimensions and shape of every piece of timber required thus saving a vast amount of time and labour that must otherwise have been spent in consideration and in the tentative fitting together of the several pieces there is no need to tax the patience of the reader by describing in detail our daily progress let it suffice to say that we worked all day and every day from dawn to sunset until at length after five weeks of strenuous but uneventful labour punctuated at intervals by thunderstorms of terrific violence accompanied by torrential downpours of rain which we thankfully utilised for the replenishment of our fresh water supply the carpenter work of our projected house was finished and then came the still more formidable task of erection we began by loading our boat with as much as she would carry of the building materials and the requisites for a few days stay upon the islet and then we left the wreck arriving at our destination rather late the same evening taking the short cut through those parts of the intersecting channels that we had already traversed upon the occasion of our discovery of the islet the choice of a site for the house and the unloading and conveyance of the tools and building materials to that site occupied the whole of another day for the site chosen was on the eastern slope of the hill about a mile distant from the cove where the boat lay involving the carrying of several heavy loads of timber all that distance uphill but it was well worth the labour for the situation afforded a magnificent an uninterrupted view of the open sea to the eastward while toward the west and southwest we had a view of a considerable portion of the island with the remarkable precipitous cliffs and a broad stretch of lagoon to the south of it spending the night of that very fatiguing day on eden we returned to the wreck on the day following a fair wind the whole way enabling us to accomplish the trip in time to load up the boat that same evening in readiness for an early start next day this mode of procedure was followed for nearly a month by the end of which period we had transported from the wreck to our islet the whole of the material for our house the chests of treasure the ship's medicine chest all the tools of every description that were to be found in the ship all the arms and ammunition the chronometer and other navigating instruments the charts and a considerable quantity of the most valuable contents of the lazarette after which we were practically independent of the wreck for as soon as we had built our house we should be in possession of everything absolutely necessary to the maintenance of life and health the house however still remained to be built and this task kept billy and me busy for another six weeks but when it was finished we found ourselves relatively speaking in clover for our house consisted of a strongly built weatherproof bungalow containing living room storeroom two bedrooms kitchen scullery fuel house and other outbuildings with a stoop and veranda extending all round it and it was roofed with deck planking corked thoroughly well tarred and then coated with sand 
The furniture was, of course, a bit rough, but it served its purpose, and it was eked out by the addition of a couple of comfortable armchairs and six deck chairs from the wreck, with, of course, beds and bedding, table linen, crockery, cutlery, and all the cooking gear. This great task accomplished, my next business was to run the boat, single-handed, to and fro between the islet and the wreck, removing from the latter everything that might by any chance be of the slightest value to us, while Billy, having developed an ambition to lay out a considerable expanse of the slope in front of the house as a garden, put in his time in the realisation of that ambition. After a time I was able to lend a hand at this job, and I finished up by setting on end, in front of the house, the brigantine's spare main topmast, which made a fine flagstaff, upon which I proposed to hoist the ship's ensign, union down, if ever a ship should heave into sight. End of chapter 9